You're listening to the Paint Podcast, where we discuss and analyze trending issues on digital rights and inclusion in Africa and from around the world. Yeah, with this channel, because how do I how do I access um, any of my files? I couldn't do that as well. I couldn't check up on my family. So the social, um, emotional, psychological, financial, even physical um, uh, disruption when you do not have access to the internet, which was pretty, pretty sad. A very good day to all our listeners. I hope that we are doing well. You are listening to the PIN podcast. I am your host, Ding Chi Igba, and this episode is on shutdowns. Not so fun fact, in 2020 alone, internet shutdowns cost Africa's economy over 2 billion US dollars. The impact is felt by citizens, businesses, and governments alike. This is according to a report published by Top 10 VPN, a UK-based digital rights advocacy group. Internet shutdowns occur when there is an intentional block or restriction of internet access, often during times of political unrest, elections, or anti-government protests. This can range from blocking specific websites and social media platforms to a complete internet blackout. In Africa, internet shutdowns have become increasingly common. Countries like Ethiopia, Nigeria, Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda have all experienced shutdowns, lasting from days to weeks or even more. That's the urgency to uh, to address this growing trend. Paradigm Initiative has put together a comprehensive episode highlighting the downsides and adverse effects of this practice on digital rights and far beyond. Our case in point being the recent shutdown in Kenya, the very first of their own, due to the hashtag Reject Finance Bill 2024. Our guests for today are Miriam Beatrice from Paradigm Initiative. Miriam is our programs officer for East Africa and she's also a passionate advocate for digital rights and girl rights, human rights. Hello Miriam, thank you for being here with us. Hi Dinchi, hi listener, thank you very much for having me. I'm super excited to have this conversation and as you're mentioning right, it just reminded me that I was actually born on International Human Rights Day. So, oh wow, <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's crying, but crying to the <laughs> and Sherry Oyer. Sherry is the Programs Officer Women's Digital Right at Kitanet, and they will be here with me today to comprehensively discuss this topic. Hi, Sherry. Good afternoon. How are you doing today? Hi, Dinchi. I am good, and it's a cold day in Nairobi, but I'm, I'm good. So, I can imagine it. It's also cold here in Abuja, Nigeria. What's new? We just want to thank you for accepting our invitation to come on the Green Podcast. Thank you so much. So, over to you, Miriam. I'm a bit curious. Would you like to tell us what it felt like being at the forefront of something so memorable? I mean, it all looked so intense on social media and in the news and I'm sure how other people saw it. So how did you feel like being in the midst of it all? Oh, thank you, Dinchi, and thank you for taking me back in time. Uh, so if I would think of one or two words I could describe it is it felt really, really awesome and I'll explain why. But then it also felt very draining, especially towards the end of, of the protest. So for people who don't know, um, the internet disruption that occurred was as a result of ongoing protests that had been going on for quite a while in Kenya and you know what triggered it was a very really problematic finance bill there, the famous fin- finance bill 2024 and young people were just fed up and they said you know what we have a right to um, to protest, we have a right to picket, our constitution allows it. Let the government know and all arms of government that we are against it, but this particular bill. So we had been going to the street 
um, for quite a while. I actually participated in all the the protests um, that were planned, other than one, because I was I was working that day. Yeah, but I participated in all of them. Um, the same way you witnessed the occurrences on social media, it was like a thousand times more just witnessing it in person. But I said it was so awesome because this was, I think, the first of, um, in, a, in a long time, that we've had young people organize, mobilize. And by young people, I mean 19 year olds, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, um, mobilized on TikTok, mobilized on Instagram. Um, you know, we would do color coding and say, when we're going out on Thursday, come out, come out with a black t-shirt uh, or like a red t-shirt. And all that coordination and mobilization was happening on social media, on WhatsApp and whatnot. Um, there was excellent coordination as well among professional professionals. So we had a team of doctors that, you know, young doctors that came together and said, you know, we are setting camp at a particular spot in town where people are protesting in case anyone is hurt. We are offering free medical services. We also had other professionals like the lawyers, young lawyers who came together and said, you know what, in as much as we are not in the street, we are here to support you legally. Um, um, call you over and we will come and, you know, get you out of, you know, jail if you're, if you're caught or if you're, I mean, the level of mobilization and coordination was spectacular. Spectacular. We had, you know, um, bus operators coming together and saying, we are offering free transport for you guys to, to go and, and protest. Well, that entire experience for me was so wholesome and we also had another group of people um the creative the influencers use their platforms their not um their lack and influence their large numbers and break down uh policy issues in different languages you know so that people everywhere can understand where we are when we are doing what we're doing and so it was the civic the amount of civic education that was happening during that time Mind blowing, mind blowing. It was so fulfilling for me, especially because in the past one or two elections, there's been um, a lot of people saying that young people are becoming apathetic. They do not know and they are not interested in the political and policy and legal environment of their country. But um, the recent protests just showed that, you know what, young people are still woke. We are very much interested in the, um, uh, the doing, the, the happenings of our country, and, you know, you better watch this space. So for me, I would say it was super, 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 super wholesome. Uh, of course, we need to remember that lives were lost, um, and it was not just bad in jails. People were killed. I saw someone actually shot just outside parliament, and that really takes away the innocence, um, if I may use that word, of the protests that were organized by peaceful protesters who just wanted their voices heard, really. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, um, lives were lost and we keep referring to them as heroes and we will never stop being their names because, you know, they represented a lot of um, young people and they were courageous and, you know, in, uh, from that perspective, then it was, it was super emotional as well in as much as we had some gains, but it was also very, very emotional to just witness um, other young people losing their lives just because of, um, you know, a right that is enshrined in the constitution. Oh, wow. That was, you know, I I saw this process on the internet, but not until you explained did I realize the level of organization that went into this um, protest. And you are right, mind-blowing is the word. And then uh, once again, we would never ever forget our heroes. I don't want to say fallen heroes because in our hearts we don't consider them fallen. Very quickly before we come back to you, Miriam, Sherry, could you provide some context as to what led to all of this for our listeners who are not very familiar with this subject and this protest? Um, yeah, so I think maybe if we just do like a walk our work back as well. Um, this started around 18th of June of this year when with regards to the finance bill 2024 that was um, there was really 
um, serious concerns about it in terms of issues of um, data protection, issues of the cost of the economy as well, the cost of living, I mean, and several other things that people were not agreeing with. And um, that is where the genesis of this, um, the, the protests, and then eventually um, what we're going to be talking about, that is the internet um, shutdown that we saw later on in, um, in the year. But, but basically, that's it. Also, Shiri, do you think internet shutdowns are necessary in some rare instances at all? There is no shape or form. Can you say that it is necessary or it is justified ever to shut down or, or throttle the gap of the internet because of the critical, um, the critical um, rights that it supports? And this has also been acknowledged by the UN Human Rights Committee that the internet actually supports the actualization of several other rights. Therefore, in my opinion, there's no, there's no way the government can actually basically justify this. Thank you so much. So in the course of carrying out research for this episode, Paradigm Initiative conducted a survey to see just how much people have been affected. Citizens of countries have been affected by internet shutdowns. So I'm going to read out a handful of the responses we got for want of time and Maria, we would wrap it up with your own personal experience of the shutdown. So the question was, please highlight any inconveniences you faced as a result of the internet shutdown. And we have someone from Kenya who said, I was unable to communicate disruption of online or mobile transactions. We also have someone from Nigeria who said, inability to be up to date on current trends, anxiety, potential loss of opportunities, and inability to accomplish certain tasks. Someone from Malawi said, I couldn't use the internet platforms and was out of communication. I couldn't make financial transactions online. From Rwanda, I was unable to access Twitter. Now X, we are going to take Kenya again. It was not easy to communicate with relatives in the election station. I remember missing an online interview because of the internet shutdown. And last but not the least, we are going back to Malawi. No communication, no access to online services such as internet banking, online news, and others. These are the various ways that internet shutdowns affect the average citizens and many more. So over to you, Miriam. Can you briefly highlight how the shutdown inconvenienced you on a personal level? Because, you know, we've been talking from us as a representative of CSOs. So how did, because we just want to get an idea of how this shutdown looked to the average Kenyan. How did the shutdown inconvenience you on a personal level? Oh, didn't she? I was depressed. <laughs> I was depressed. So I, I may not be a, a, an accurate representation of, you know, a typical Kenyan, but I will speak as an accurate representation of a typical Gen Z um, in Kenya. Let me tell you, that was the first time ever I experienced any sort of internet disruption. So. That meant, that meant that my, I couldn't work. Of course, I work remotely because our organization um, works remotely. So I couldn't work, I couldn't access any emails, I couldn't um, you know, do anything pertaining to that. I also, as a protester, and having come from protests that very day and seeing people shot, I couldn't access any information. I didn't know what was happening. There were rumors of the Kenya Defense Forces being released. Um, and there was a sense of fear. So we, we couldn't, we just locked ourselves in, in, in my house and I couldn't access that, any, that, um, any of that information. I am also a student, you know, I'm having my master's on the own, purely virtual. So I also could not access um, any sort of reading material, right? So that disrupted my work life, my academic life, my social life. It was, it was completely, completely terrible. And I was only lucky because when that happened, I was at all, as I've told you, if I was relying on the, the internet and um, what, we, what we use mostly in Kenya, M-Pesa, for fast fare, yeah, I would be stranded. Because how do I, how do I access 
um, any of my files, I couldn't do that as well. I couldn't check up on my family. So the social, um, emotional, psychological, financial, even physical um, uh, disruption when you do not have access to the internet, which was pretty, pretty sad. So um, we'll return to you, Sherry. What did CSOs do in response to being a we online? We saw some petty shops going around and we saw um, some press releases and all of that. But what, what do you have from an insider perspective? What CSOs did in response to this? And okay, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I think. First of all, um, just from a Kenyan perspective, um, we've always been very, um, very comforted that this can never happen in this country because you had several of the government um, assuring um, students that this is not a move that they would take, and therefore, even when, yeah, and even when we were see, we were foreseeing that probably this is something that could happen, um, ESOs like, for instance, Kicktonet and and Pride Initiative that's also um, Pan African. Um, Mazalendo, several um, other 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 organizations. What we did was that just initially, even before it happened, um, we did a press a release to the Communications Authority and to the Ministry of ICT and Digital Economies, and just reminding them of that um, of that commitment that they have that they that they have committed not to shut down the internet in any eventuality. And it is so. Um, it is. It was. It was a shock because literally the next day um, there was also. Um, they, they actually responded and said that that would not happen. However, the next day that is exactly what happened. You know. So <laughs> the the the, CS, the CSOs came together to ensure that they reminded the government and the the, the regulators of the, that commitment that they had made. But also, um, other than that, also we have also had uh, even in terms of preparedness for such eventualities that um, organizations, CSOs have also been really. If you look at publications even from Kenya and several other countries as well, um, organizations coming together and even training on issues of um, internet shutdown and how to circumvent such in such instances. I think that is some of the things that um, the CSOs actually did. And when eventually, um, of course, the internet was shut down, those was throttling, and they did not relent. We did not relent. We have still continuously um, held the government accountable, the, the, the regulators accountable by um, pointing out to this. And I think even more in, in, in terms of um, in terms of next step, and even if, if this ever happens again, I think other things that could also still happen are maybe public interest litigation on these issues as well, because um, of of the, the effect that it has. I mean, uh, for instance, when one when we're doing the press release, we just we didn't just um, focus on the fact that it affected the process, but also even um, also highlighted. On the economic uh, impact of this, on the on the on the effect to access to health, to education, and all those those other rights that are collectively um, enjoyed through the internet. Okay, okay, that is. Uh, I have to say, bravo to all the CSOs involved. They yeah. are, these people are really going out on the way. Are there any key takeaways or lessons that um, you have drawn from this internet shutdown experience? Yeah, um, I think I think the some of the lessons that we, of course, also just um, exposing our underbelly on how much reliant we are on 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 the internet. For instance, um, if you look at the um, situation and the the Kenyan landscape, you know the popular impressa. So all our transactions are basically on the online platform, you know. So yeah. um, you might, like, I mean, like the government might be targeting one thing, but uh, it ends up affecting um, various um, various other things. So if I, some of yeah, I think some of um, the lessons that I've learned is uh, just basically that we the, the the criticality of the internet it became very apparent. I mean, it's it, it's something that we know of and we they live on the internet for instance but we really sometimes do not really appreciate how much we rely on it 
and I think um, even those conversations where I think most of the conversations have been had on whether to make an internet a, a, a right guaranteed under the constitution and I mean um, and seeing how, how critical it is and how much um, things um, screech to a halt when the internet is shut down I think it's those conversations that have to be had now and, and in, even in the East African um, continent even in Kenya that this is something that is, is really uh, critical I mean, also just reflecting on how critical it is, then it also brings to the fore that there are people who are not connected at all, and therefore they need to also bring them on, on board as well. So I think it also just exposed those, the need of it, and also remembering the people who are not really connected and how to now bridge that gap as well. Okay, thank you, Shiri. So this is my very last question. This is your party shots to the audience. Um, what is your message to relevant stakeholders in the digital rights space on this matter and I mean the government, I mean the CSOs, I mean just the digital rights actors and advocate what is um, just you know the relevant message you would um, like to leave with them today. Oh, okay, first of all, thank you very much, Dean Chi, for having me. Thanks to the listeners for engaging with us. Um, I think my parting shot would be to iterate that access to the internet and keeping the internet on um, is a fundamental right, um, and we should not be in a position where we are forced to even beg for it. And so actors who have the ability, cap capability, the resources to fight against um, entities that uh, want to make this a habit should do so and um, condemn this act in the strongest term possible. But I'd also like to challenge particularly civil society actors um, in the sector. Um, we just need to critically think about um, the resilience, if I may call that, um, if I may call it that, of our internet. I also just forgot to mention that when they disrupted the internet in Kenya, it also affected other countries. Um, or around. Um, so, it, yeah, it affected Uganda, it affected Rwanda, it, affe it affected Burundi. Um, and to also just let everyone know, um, civil society actors, media, and everyone, that no, no one is immune to such violations and we should just be woke um, and, and ready and fight it. Because now, for, you know, our protests disrupted the um, livelihoods of other people across across the East African region. And so we just need to start thinking about how do we advocate for a free, safe um, internet for all as civil society actors and to, you know, ensure that this never happens again. So um, let's keep on the internet. That will be my potential. So, all right. We all heard Miriam. Let's hope that the right this podcast goes to the right places to the people in power. Let's keep on the internet. That is our key takeaway from this podcast. Thank you once again, Miriam, for agreeing to come on. If you've listened up to this point and you're wondering just how to better prepare yourself for such eventualities, I have good news for you. Paradigm Initiative has this digital right toolkit called Ayeta and that's A-Y-E-T-A. So it basically teaches you how to be safe and equipped on the internet just google or type into whatever browser you're using ayeta.africa and it's right there for you and the best part is that it is totally free thank you so much for joining us today hope to see you another time thanks for joining us on today's pink podcast be sure to join you for our next episode you can follow us on our social media platforms facebook tiktok twitter and instagram at paradigm hq